verse 1 through verse 3. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a whining baby, we might say. <laughs> but let's look at this and see what we can, can uh, glean from this passage. That might be of some practical use in our own lives. We know that Jonah has preached to the city of Nineveh. His message was a simple one. It was an eight-word message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was his message. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now imagine for just a moment what an incredible act of obedience and even what an incredible act of courage this was. He enters into an incredibly large city. Uh, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 2 as well as chapter 4 we'll see in verse 11, God refers to Nineveh as that great city. And so it's been said the true and accurate measure of anything is what God calls it. And God called Nineveh that great city. As mentioned, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. It was intimidating and it was large. It took three days to walk around the outskirts of the city. And the Bible tells us that Jonah had walked for a day and he didn't even reach the center of the city because he was moving from place to place as he was doing that. During this time, its population was no less than 120,000. We'll see that at the conclusion of our study. That would have been the children, more than likely. So imagine what it would have been like as Jonah walks into the city. How small he would feel. One man against an ancient, populated, and sophisticated city. Not only was it an ancient city sophisticated in many ways, but it was also known for its evil and known for its violence. And so, for him to enter into a city known for evil and violence and to proclaim a message like that, in 40 days, this city will be overthrown, was a courageous thing to do. So as he is entering in and approaching the heart of the city, he is crying out judgment. You see, Sodom had been overthrown, and as Sodom had been overthrown, so will Nineveh be. It will be a rapid and it will be a complete destruction from the hand of the Almighty God. And so as he's going through the city and he's beginning to proclaim this message, we have to ask ourselves, what, are, what will the reaction of the people be? Will they be mocking him? Will they erupt in violence? Will they reject him? Well, as we've been looking at this book, we notice they began to listen to him and they actually heard his message. And then upon hearing the message, the people of Nineveh immediately repented. Chapter 3, verse 5 tells us they believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and they put on sackcloth. And these are emblems of what would be called genuine repentance. They believed God, meaning they understood the message that was being given was not from Jonah. The message that was being given was from God. And that, by the way, is a very important thing to not allow to get past you. The message of the gospel was not created by man. And Paul was not the originator of the gospel. Jesus Christ, who is the word of God, communicated this that we call the gospel to us. And the word of God originates with God himself. And so when the word of God is being proclaimed, that is what God intends to use to bring people to a salvation knowledge of himself through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So see, that's why it's so important, by the way, for the word of God to be, to be preserved and communicated. 
because that's how God intends to save people is through his word. So he goes through and they recognize that this message was, was not from Jonah, some angry man, but it's from God himself. And, and the response was they proclaimed a fast. Now, when it says that they proclaimed a fast, that demonstrates that they humbled their heart before the Lord because fasting is a demonstration of, of humility. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. So fasting is, is a, a, an a outer kind of a demonstration of mourning and weeping or true repentance. And so they fasted. They also put on sackcloth, which is a visible sign of mourning. And so the result is that God saw their works, and he saw that they turned from their evil ways, and had repentance, and so he spared the great city. Now, I want to develop this a little bit further before we get into chapter 4 by saying, in this we see four elements of turning a city around for God. One, if you want to turn around a city for God, there needs to be faithful preaching of the word of God. If you want to turn around a city for God, there has to be the preaching of God's message. Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. We're living in a time, and I'll say this briefly, but we're living in a time where well, we have to return to the roots of the Christian church, which is that all churches ought to be doing, by the way, and that is teaching and preaching the word of God. Let me, let me give you a, a very brief glimpse into current trends. Many pastors believe right now, and, and I have quite a number of people I know that are discussing this. Magazines are being written. Books are being written. There are many people right now who are thinking that this younger generation that's coming up really doesn't have a respect for the Word of God, and therefore, you should be very careful not to bore them with Bible studies. That's the truth. I think if there's anything technology has done, technology is great, and I'm thankful for the tools that we have. We're able to use technology for so many good things, and I thank God for it. It also can be used to dumb down people, and, uh, and that actually has happened. We, we, we see even in things like Facebook and, and Twitter and various other ways of e-messaging e and emailing and all, all that, people in reality, um, the reason that we send emails many times is because we don't feel like talking to the person. So we have a phone that we could actually use and say, hey, but we don't. We just send them a mail, a message, right? We just write them a little note, bang, send it out. Why? Because I really don't feel like talking to you right now, but I would like to communicate something to you. I mean, and, and that's, that's just a fact. And what has happened is we have substituted, we have substituted the personal for the impersonal, but in the impersonal, we think we're being personal. We think that we're still connected. And, and you know this and I know this. I'm just talking to people who are aware of that. That's what happens. That's what has happened. What we have done is we have substituted the impersonal for the personal to the degree that we don't even see the value of interpersonal relationship. We, we preach a gospel, a gospel message that speaks concerning God himself wanting to be personal with us. I mean, isn't that what the incarnation is? God dwelt amongst men. God wants us to know him. The Lord Jesus Christ has revealed him. He dwelt amongst men so that this God, the invisible God, has taken upon himself human flesh so that man can see God as God walks around with men. That's a, is that not a personal kind of thing? I mean, obviously it is. All of us understand that to be true. And yet what we're doing with this personal message of the gospel, because each individual on earth who hears this gospel is to respond to it is a personal message to people that speaks concerning a personal life you see what happens is you get saved and you're not saved to be all alone you're saved and you're brought into a community of people who are like-minded it's called the church and so the church is 
is supposed to be a place of community where we have koinonia or fellowship with one another. And so you read your Bible. Love one another, pray for one another, exhort one another, encourage one another. Confess your faults one to another. It's one another, one another, one another. Because that's what Christianity is. It's about us being together in him. The church in the original was originally together, and they remained in the apostles' doctrine and, and prayer and the breaking of bread and, and all of those things. That was the element of the early church, right? But what we've done is we have taken the message of the gospel, depersonalizing it, and we have made it a message that can be communicated but you don't necessarily have to have a living, breathing individual who's doing that. And we know that already because you can be driving when you go home and you can turn on the radio, you can turn on K-Wave, KKLA, and you'll hear a message, some voice coming over the airwaves into your car. Or you can go home and turn on a television. And if you want, you can watch a Christian broadcast. All of that, by the way, I'm blessed that we're doing and able to do. But if that's the only way that you're receiving your feeding, you're missing out on the personal. The personal. Like it or not. Because some people don't like it. But like it or not, it's better to be in a room where somebody's shoulder just touched yours and you're saying, ooh, cooties. It's better. <laughs> it's, it's better that there's a human being next to you than for you to be alone. What is the first bad thing you find in Scripture? The first thing that ever is said, it is not good. It is not good that the man should be what? Alone. Why? Because God created us to have relationship. That's why. And the gospel intends to produce a format for that. And so it's not simply the preaching of the gospel it is the preaching, receiving, and living of the gospel. And we have to be careful to realize that if we want to turn a city around, that city has to have a gospel message preached and lived by those who claim to believe it. Because what I am speaks so loudly that some people can't hear a word that I say. And so we communicate this message called the gospel. So if we want to turn the city around, the gospel has to be preached and lived. Uh, secondly, there needs to be a genuine trust in God. Uh, if, if somebody is going to really come to faith in Christ, uh, they need to turn away from sin and turn to God. There are, there are actual um, studies that are done concerning um, sometimes some of the um, crusades or evangelistic efforts that many churches throughout the United States go through and do where they will actually uh, interview the people who went forward and will ask them, um, now that you've gone forward, why did you go forward, and can you give us a, uh, some insight into how you're living now that you have gone, gone forward in a crusade? And, and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the people who are being interviewed are saying, well, you know, yeah, I went forward, but I still don't go to church. Why would I go to church? I don't want to go to church. You know, well, why did you go to that crusade? I liked the music. The music was cool. It was good. It was free. I had a good time. I liked that kind of thing. If you spend some time, any time at all, and you start looking at some of the formats that some churches have today for church services, it's more like going to a rock concert than it is a worship service. That's a fact. We have to be very careful even in this because I like high-powered music. I like that. That's the kind of music I listen to. You know, before I got saved, I was, a, you know, metalhead. You know, that's what I was. I like loud music. Sorry, and I'm going deaf, so I don't even notice it. <laughs> I'm not going deaf. But I've always liked energetic. I do, I do, and that's, that's you know, we're not trying to have concerts here. Just saying that, it's, that's the kind of music I prefer. I like to worship and praise God. I like that an awful lot. But we're not doing concerts. The worship is not, you know, with a bunch of lights and smoke and things like that, you know, because I think that obscures the reason that we're together. The reason we're together is to worship Jesus Christ. And so we need to remember that. And, and uh, a third thing there needs to be a taking of action. And what happened here is they proclaimed a fast, they put on sackcloth, because that demonstrates genuine repentance. And then finally, there needs to be a turning away from specific sin. What they had turned away from uh, was their evil and their violence. 
So you see, when, when a person truly repents, they are no longer going to be characterized by their sin. So God spared the city. Now, Jonah's an evangelist. You would think that Jonah would be overjoyed. That, that's the heart of any evangelist. Listen, to see an entire city, a huge city like this, turn to Christ, turn to God, in the Old Testament sense, to turn to God. And so God spared the city. You know, yet 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. They all repent. And this evangelist ought to be saying, man, God, you're too much. But that's not what we see. Verse 1, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord. He said, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Imagine Greg Laurie doing that. <laughs> it's better for me to die than to live. The whole city came to know you. Oh, just kill me. God showed incredible mercy. God has shown incredible mercy, think of it, to Jonah. God has shown incredible mercy to those sailors on that ship. God has shown incredible mercy to the city. And yet, it displeases him, and he becomes exceedingly angry. Remember, Nineveh is evil. Nineveh is violent. In Jonah's mind, Nineveh does not deserve to remain. It should be destroyed. Again, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and those surrounding cities for similar sins. Why did he not destroy Nineveh? And so his response, verse 2, simply says he prayed to the Lord. He complains to God. And what is he complaining about? Notice with me. He's complaining that God is gracious, merciful, patient, and of great kindness. He's complaining to God for being good. I think he preferred the message of destruction. I think he wanted them to die. It's like when Jesus was about to go through a city that refused him entry. And uh, James and John approach Jesus and say, would you like us to call down fire like Elijah did and consume them? There are some who have that kind of attitude. Jonah, obviously, in the Old Testament did. Here's something for you. Think about this. In this complaint, Jonah's trying to prove that God is wrong for showing mercy. Even today... We can refuse to desire God to forgive a terrible sinner. We can refuse to believe that he will. We can refuse to desire that he would. When you, when you read the New Testament, we all are familiar with a man by the name of Paul. And Paul was, by his own testimony, a terrible sinner. When he speaks concerning his previous life prior to Christ, he says, like in Acts 22.4, he says, I persecuted this way to the death binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. When he was writing to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 13, he said to that church, you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. His testimony was so widespread that he was so dangerous that when he got saved, people refused to believe that he could be saved. The Lord speaks to a man by the name of Ananias after God has dealt with, with Saul. His name was Saul at that time. And he says, I want you to go and I want you to pray for this man. And uh, when the Lord said that to him, it's recorded in Acts 9, 13 through 14, Ananias answered and said this. This is amazing. Uh, I, uh, Lord, I, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Listen, I know you've been running the universe and you probably haven't noticed this. So if you don't mind, let me explain to you why I'm not about to go and, and pray for this man. He, he is a destroyer. Ananias didn't believe it. The church didn't believe it. 
Acts 9, 26, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Uh-uh, you cannot join us. We don't trust you. Your reputation is so incredibly bad. There's no way we believe that you actually came to faith in Christ. Anybody in here know anybody, anybody at all, that you believe is just too far gone to ever be saved? Never forget, that's probably what somebody thought about you. Too far gone. Too crazy. I've told you this story, I just think of it. Forgive me for those who've heard it a thousand times. I'm a young believer. I'm in a Christian concert. Band comes up and plays. In front of me is a motorcycle gangster. Big old guy. I estimate him at 6'4", about 300 pounds. That's a good-sized guy. He was so big, I couldn't see the stage. True. I, I was leaning over to look past him. He had this long hair. He was wearing his, 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 uh, his Levi jacket that was cut. He had his colors on. Huge. And I couldn't even see the stage because it was so close. I had to lean over to my right or I'd have to lean over. I didn't tap him, him on the shoulder and ask him to move. I just, <laughs> just let him be the wall that he was. <laughs> but I'm thinking as the next band, J.C. Power Outlet, that's what it was called, I think. Hard rock Christian band at that time. They got up and this evangelist just started giving the word. And I'm looking at this guy. He's right in front of me. I'm just staring at him. He can't get saved. He can't get saved. I'm actually thinking that. I remember. He, he can't get This is a waste of his time. He can't get saved. And then the man who's giving the message says, if you need Christ and you want a new life, stand to your feet and come forward. And this mountain stands up in front of me. And he starts rubbing his eyes because he's crying. And he makes his way through the aisle. I'll never forget this. Stumbles into the aisle. He's crying so hard. And stands up there, this huge man standing around these other people. He's in the center, right in front of the man who gave the invitation. The Spirit of the Lord has a way of speaking to your heart. And his... Spirit spoke to my heart, and I've never forgotten when he said, I can save anyone. I can save anyone. Never forget that. Don't give up. Keep praying. Don't forget that. God can save anyone. Pray for them. Seek the Lord. Because that's really what it's all about, isn't it? You see, Paul had been saved. Salvation. He had experienced it. And he says in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, how thankful I am to Christ Jesus our Lord for considering me trustworthy and appointing me to serve him. Even though I used to scoff at the name of Christ, I hunted down his people, harming them in every way I could. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how kind and gracious the Lord was. He filled me completely with faith and the love of Christ Jesus. This is a true saying and everyone should believe it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I was the worst of them all. But that is why God had mercy on me, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Well, instead of him rejoicing at what is taking place, he reveals really the reason that he ran away. The reason he went, ran away from his calling was he knew that God was gracious and God was merciful, that God is slow to anger, and God is abundant in loving kindness. Aren't you glad that he is, by the way? Aren't you? I am so grateful that he is. So he's angry because God isn't going to destroy these evil people. So what's your prayer request, Jonah? Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die. He's a man of prayer. 
but he's not praying in a way that pleases the Lord. Isn't it a good thing that God doesn't answer every prayer that you pray with a yes? So God begins to speak to him. Look how gracious and merciful God is to this man. Verse 4, the Lord says this, Is it right for you to be angry? Well, many lessons begin with a question. Jesus is a great example of this way of teaching. When you read his words, he asks questions. Listen to some of his questions. These are questions Jesus asked. Why do you worry about your clothing? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is it that you're looking for? What good will it be for a man if he gained the whole world yet forfeits his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus asked a lot of questions. And the questions that he would ask were intended to elicit from us a response because the response is going to reveal our hearts. And when God asks a question, he wants us to reveal our hearts. And, and, and as, as you answer the question, it reveals your heart. But the point of this question is very simply this. Which one of us between you and me is right, Jonah? Who has the proper perspective here? Am I right in showing mercy, or are you right in desiring judgment? Well, in that question, verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. He went out there waiting to see, you know what, they're going to blow it. And maybe God will destroy them. And I want to have a front row seat when that takes place. How did you answer that question, Jonah? Here's something for you. You might want to remember this always. How did you answer that question, Jonah? I answer that question by avoiding giving an answer. He's a good politician. I answered the question by not answering the question. There are a lot of people like that. Here's something for you that's practical. Um, I, I've been here, and I, and I will be in the future. And I will be in that place in the future when I say it like this. I have heard messages, or I've been reading and preparing one, where the Holy Spirit asks me a question concerning me and that passage. And I can hide by saying, well, I'm preparing this for people who need to hear it. And the Lord saying, no, you need to hear it. Because before you preach it, you'd better live it. Before you give it, you better understand it. And I have to tell you, every preacher preaches above what they actually can live. That's just a fact. Because the lofty claims and demands of the gospel without God's help are impossible in any way to attain to. That's a fact. But that doesn't give to us any excuse to just disregard it either. And a lot of times in church services, even like this, there is a discomfort level that begins to hit the heart of the person and they begin to find things about what they're hearing that they disagree with and they get angry about. And rather than answering the spiritual question where God says, am I speaking to you right now? And do you hear what I'm saying? They run just like Jonah did because they are set in the way that they think. And they're thinking there's got to be a loophole somewhere. There's got to be something that can be done. In his case, he avoids even answering the question. He just steps out, goes, and he begins to wait. He wants to see if God's going to do something Maybe, maybe they won't change in 40 days and maybe the judgment will be uh, brought about because God's just postponing it. So let's hang around and see. So what does he do? Well, let me give you a couple things here. Uh, one, what does he do? He, he quits his mission by leaving the city. God didn't tell him to leave. He just decided to on his own. He should have remained. He should have taught them the way of God, but he didn't. Second, he built himself a shelter which means he isolated himself from the people who had responded. He desired no fellowship with these people who were different from him. He could say this, I have nothing in common with them. Why do I want to be around people like that? 
Here in the United States, if we don't feel comfortable with the people that we're seated next to, we'll go to a place that we feel comfortable. Did you, how many of you have a brother or a sister? Please raise your hand. Did you choose them? Did you? Did your mom, if you're older, did your mom and dad walk up and say, oh, by the way, we're planning on having a brother or a sister. What do you think? Oh, yes, that would be marvelous. Did they ask you? My parents didn't ask me. They didn't say, oh, by the way, you've got an older brother whom you did not choose. But we want a couple more. What do you think, Dave? Nah. Say, if we can get rid of him and it'd just be me, that'd be fine. I did not select my sisters. Did you? Did you select a brother or sister? Did you? I didn't. I didn't. Nobody asked me. Nobody consulted me. Nobody asked me permission. They just went on and had other brats. How wrong is that? Can you select your brother or sister in Christ? And, and if you can't, here's something. It's practical. I'm not trying to be mean or weird. It's just practical. If they're your brother or sister in Christ, can we love them? And do we have to flee to somewhere else where there are more people like us? Is that what we do when we're uncomfortable? Let's just move to where there's some people more like us. You know, the church still has to get over its prejudice. Still does. The body of Christ still has to deal with that kind of thing. Love covers everything. We ought to love one another. I cannot choose my brother or sister in Christ, but I can choose to fellowship with them, and I can choose to love them, and I can choose to bear with them, and I can choose to have fellowship with them. I can make those choices. I didn't choose them to be saved, but I certainly ought to do everything I can to have fellowship with those people who have been. A third thing, he waited to see if God would destroy the city, and therefore he became a spectator. He openly hoped that God would change his mind. Perhaps they were really not saved at all. Here's something, here's some ancient history. I'll say it quickly as I'm looking at my time. I better hurry this up. The Jesus movement, which for many of you is just a footnote in history. It's not something that you were even alive when it began. But I can tell you this, as somebody who got saved during that movement, I can tell you this, that when hippies like me were getting saved, hippies like me were getting saved, we did not look, we did not look like the church of our day. We did not look like them. The church in our day, short hair, the men short hair, wore suits and ties to church, very formal, very formal time. Uh, women would wear um, their, uh, their dresses, you know, and always dressed up, you know. They used to call it the Sunday go to meet and close. That was very real. That was very real. When I was young, my mom would actually wear a hat to church. It was much more formal, you know. And though hippies are now getting saved, and we're going to church barefooted, and we're not cutting our hair, and we've got rock music, which people were writing about saying it's satanic. They brought voodoo into the church. They believed it was satanic music because you had drums and because you had electric guitars. And the world, church world, stood back saying, let's just watch and see what really happens if they're really getting saved. Books were written about the Jesus movement at that time. It was just a flash in the pan, wasn't going to last. It's just a bunch of hippies who think they got religion. That's what people do sometimes. Unfortunately, Jonah's waiting for them to fall too. So what happens? Well, let's rush to a conclusion. Verse 6. The Lord God prepared a plant, made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. 
Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, shut up. No. God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. The Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much livestock? Okay, God begins a work of preparation. He prepared a plant. This plant is a shrub. It has broad leaves like vine leaves. It has a very dense shadow. It sustains itself by a trunk. It can grow very rapidly. Even in the natural, it can grow within a few days and look like a small tree. God did this work. He did a miracle, and he, he prepared this plant. He prepared the plant to provide shade for Jonah to deliver him from his misery. This could provide him enough comfort to consider his own heart. Second, he prepared a worm to destroy the plant. This removed the comfort of the shade and caused him to experience the full sun. He even went into, some said, even a, a form of uh, sunstroke. Third, he prepared a strong wind to combine with the heat of the sun. And in doing these three things of preparation, a fourth thing, he prepared Jonah. He prepared Jonah to be taught. So God says to him, is it right? And Jonah says, listen, it's better for me to die than to live. God pushed him to his limit. God broke him. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Well, God said to Jonah, is it right? Jonah said, he's saying to Jonah, you know, Jonah, you care for yourself. You care for even something like a plant. But this plant, you didn't, you didn't plant it. You didn't tend it. You didn't water it. You didn't cause it to grow. What you did is you took pleasure in it because it provided something for you. It grew and it perished. And because it grew and perished, you felt sorry for it. You felt pity because it was pleasing to you and you were comforted by it. Well, Jonah, I feel pity for Nineveh. It's filled with people who don't know any better. You see, in verse 11, when he says, there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left. Right hand and their left. Those of you who are parents know that you can tell your, your three-year-old, you know, go to the left. Do they know what you mean? No, no, take a right. Do they know what you mean? They don't know what you mean. A three-year-old doesn't know left from right. We used to say, he doesn't know his left hand from his right. Where do we get that saying from? Well, it's a biblical saying. It's, it's a way of saying that these are people who have yet to mature. So there are two things. One, some are saying that it's saying that these are, these are spiritually immature people who don't know the left from the right. They're not really able to make spiritual uh, judgments. And some will say that, this 120. But it's more common to believe that he's speaking of the children. And he's saying they've got 120,000 babies there. And beyond that, you have to, you know, during that time, the, the number of actual population would have been several times more than that. And so he's saying this is a huge and immense city. You feel sorry for a plant, Jonah, and I have pity on a city. You're an evangelist, and you're supposed to take my message. You were glorying in the judgment and not the grace. You wanted me to be angry when I'm not angry. You're misrepresenting my heart because I want to save these people. Should I not have pity on these who really don't know any better yet? And I gave them a chance by giving them a message. It was a warning. What's interesting to me is the book actually ends with a question. And that question continues to this day. It hasn't ceased. It's still a question. Are you angry at me because I'm good? Are you angry because I saved the one you didn't want to get saved? You wanted them to perish and go to hell. They harmed you. Yes, they caused pain in your life indeed. I remember, and I'll give you one last story. I remember sharing with somebody who was very dear to me at that time who was going through very deep stress in their marriage. And they were going to divorce. And this was many, many, many years ago. And as I was speaking to them, 
It was a woman. I was speaking to her. I said, God can heal your marriage. God can heal your marriage. Hang on. Her husband at that time wasn't saved, and she wasn't saved. But I said, hang on. Don't let go. God is a wonder-working God. I knew her very, very well. I'd known her since we were in high school. I was greatly concerned for her. But she had a friend. She had a friend who had been divorced, and her friend was influencing her, and her friend said to her, my husband, my husband divorced me, broke my heart. He was an evil man, but now he's a Christian. Now he's a Jesus freak. Why should he be happy, and why should I be miserable? And she kept pouring that into this girl because this girl's husband had gotten saved, and I was telling her, your husband can be the man you want him to be. God's changing him. Hang on. But the bitterness of the heart of her friend overrode this woman's desire to see God do something in her husband. They ended up divorcing. And I saw what happened not only to her and her husband, but also their two children through that kind of mentality. Some people think they, don't, they shouldn't get saved. Look at what they've done. We have to get past that, guys. You know how you can know when you really understand forgiveness is when you can pray with sincerity for the one who has hurt you. When you can pray with sincerity for the one who has hurt you. When you can say, God, be merciful upon them instead of being like Jonah, yet 40 days and you're going to be dust. God, you answer prayer, don't you? Kill them in Jesus' name. The way you know that God is unhealing in your heart is when you can say, God, be merciful to them. They know not what they do.